The format is as follows. There will be opening statements, starting with Mr. Lane, of 12 minutes each, rebuttal of nine minutes, further rebuttal of six minutes, then a question and answer period with alternating questions from members of the audience to each of the participants, and finally, closing statements of four minutes each. I intend to enforce the ground rules rigorously. Mr. Lane? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. It has been said in the press that three years ago, I embarked upon a lonely crusade, and I stood almost alone in this country with some doubts about the official version of what happened in Dallas on November 22, 1963. I never was alone, never for one instant, although the media, radio, television, newspapers almost unanimously endorsed the Commission's report and served as salesmen to the American people. Although the government very clearly took its position, I never was alone because I spoke at some 85 college campuses throughout this country. And I discovered then that which I really knew before, and that is that you, you said that you loved him. You said that you loved the things for which he lived. And unlike the vast majority of the American people and almost the, the media unanimously, you did not show a callous disregard for the manner in which he died. And so I'm happy to be back here again today. The recent issue of your student publication carries an article presenting a vast amount of information on the question of the origin of the shots, which of course is a classic question in the determination of the guilt of any person charged with the commission of a crime. That being so, I will not deeply go into that area, but into other areas. I should say, however, at the outset, that one of the problems that we've had in trying to develop a debate on this question is that not a single member of the Warren Commission, not one member of the Commission, is willing to defend the Commission report in open and public debate. Not one. That thereby limits our debating ability, unfortunately, to others. Now we come to the senior counsel. No, I don't mean to be snide, and I'm not being snide. We then come to the senior counsel of the commission. I would much prefer to debate Earl Warren. He's the one who sold that report to the American people. He's the one who said, I'm a man of integrity. You must believe that report. Why surveys taken in this country after the report was issued? When persons were asked, what is the single biggest fact, piece of evidence, which convinces you that Oswald was the lone assassin? The vast majority of the people answered, Earl Warren said so. That's the evidence. Well, I'd like to see Mr. Warren or Mr. Ford or any of the other members of the commission stand up and defend their report, but they will not. Then we come to the senior counsel for the commission, Mr. Ball, for example, of Los Angeles, who refuses to debate with us. Uh, and so we cannot uh, have a discussion with senior counsel, and so we're discussing it with Mr. Lieblin. I'm very pleased that he is willing to come forward and to present the commission's case. I would like to comment upon something which Mr. Ball said because he was one of the important senior attorneys who dealt with questioning witnesses regarding, some witnesses, regarding the origin of the shots and what they saw, what they heard on November 22nd. A number of witnesses standing up on that railroad bridge overlooking the Dealey Plaza area said that when the shots were fired, they looked to their left and there they saw a grassy knoll and above it at the top of it a wooden fence with landscape with bushes and trees. And a number of those men have said that when they looked there, they saw puffs of smoke, or a puff of smoke, most of them said, one or two said puffs, but seven of them said that they saw at least a puff of smoke rise from that area, evidently coming from behind the wooden fence. Is that relevant? Of course it's relevant. Mr. Ball recently spoke at the Associated Press Managing Editors Conference uh, early, uh, late last year in San Diego. And what did Mr. Ball say there? Remember, this is your lawyer who you sent there to Dallas to get the facts as to the origin of the shots. What did he say? I quote now from the Associated Press coverage of the debate, verbatim coverage of this portion. Question by Mr. Ball in the midst of his speech. What does a puff of smoke mean? 
Does it mean that there's a rifle? Of course not. Since when did rifles give off a puff of smoke? They don't do it. This statement was made two years after the Warren Commission report was issued, two years after the 26 volumes of evidence were issued. And what is present in those 26 volumes? A letter from J. Edgar Hoover to the Warren Commission stating the alleged assassination weapon was tested and even in broad daylight when fired, it emits a puff of white smoke. Two years later, the attorney for the commission was either in absolute ignorance of the evidence submitted to the commission on this crucial question or deliberately made a false statement to the American people through the Associated Press. This is some of the problems that we have, the abysmal ignorance of those who were charged. I hope it was just abysmal ignorance of those who were charged with securing the information for us. Well, that's a classic question. Where did the shots come from? There's another classic question. Is the alleged murder weapon, and I will not deal with the first one any further because it has been dealt with in the press and particularly here at this university, but there is another basic question, classic question in any case. Is the alleged murder weapon capable of the performance which the prosecutors say that it gave in the hands of the alleged assassin? Mark Twain said, whoso clinging to a rope severeth it above his hands must fall, it being no defense that the rest of the rope is sound. Well, if the rifle is not capable of doing that which the commission said it did, that's the end of the case against Lee Harvey Oswald as the man who used that weapon to kill President Kennedy. Well, let's go back to J. Edgar Hoover, who was uh, discussing through the mail the question of a rifle test with J. Lee Rankin, General Counsel of the Commission. I quote now from Mr. Hoover's letter, words of caution as to how to conduct such a test. Quote, in connection with these tests, it should be noted that the accuracy of the rifle would depend upon the quality of the ammunition used, the condition of the weapon at the time of firing, and the expertness of the shooter. However, none of these conditions can be determined for the time of the assassination. Well, I agree with Mr. Hoover, the certain close quote, that certain uh, caution must be taken in approaching the test to see to it that it does resemble the events which the commission said took place that day. Let's start, number one, with the ammunition. I testified before the commission. I raised the fact that some had said that the ammunition was not capable of firing because it was old ammunition and it might not be too reliable. I said it might be of questionable reliability because it was old. Commission finding, they take that statement as they did all factual material and put it under the heading of speculation. Now we come to commission finding, quote, the ammunition used in the rifle was American ammunition recently made by the Western Cartridge Company, which manufactures such ammunition currently. Recently made, manufactures it currently. So we just wrote to the company and they wrote back, quote, concerning the only company which manufactures it and the company which was listed by the commission as being the one which recently made it and manufactures, manufactures the the ammunition currently. Concerning your inquiry of the 6.5 millimeter Mandelker Carcano ca cartridge, this is not being produced commercially by our company at this time. Any previous production on this cartridge was against government contracts which were completed back in 1944, which is precisely what I said to the commission, about 20 years old. I was a half a year off, as it turns out. The commission was 20 years off. Another letter from the commission, from the uh, manufacturer, the reliability of such ammunition would be questionable today. Now, this is the statement of the company which manufactures the, manufactures the ammunition, which the commission says does not exist. There is no such thing. Although, in the testimony before the commission, Cortland Cunningham, an FBI firearms expert, said uh, that the, that the uh, ammunition was re-imported, re-imported. In other words, manufacturers sent abroad and then it had to be brought back, indicating to the commission a red flag, obviously, that if it was being manufactured here, there would not be any way of being sure that the, uh, the ammunition was re-imported. This was a signal to the commission to look and they paid no attention to it, sloughed it off and merely made a statement which has absolutely no basis in fact. All right, we've dealt with the ammunition. Now let's deal with the weapon itself. What does the commission say about the weapon? Based on these tests, the experts agree that the assassination rifle was an accurate weapon, in fact, as accurate as current military rifles. That's this uh, 1898 designed Italian Manlika Carcano. 
Let's see what uh, W. H. B. Smith, author of the National Rifle Association books, the, the basic manual of military small arms, says about the same weapon. The rifle, these rifles are poor military weapons in comparison with United States, British, German, or Russian equipment. Another expert, Mechanics Illustrated, Mandelka Carcano is crudely made, poorly designed, dangerous and inaccurate, unhand unhandy, crude, unreliable on repeat shots, has safety design fault. And the rifle book, this rifle has a coy habit of blowing the firing pin out in the shooter's face. Com <laughs> commission says this is a fine rifle, as good as any military rifle manufactured in the world. The commission statement. Okay, that's the rifle. Now let's talk about the telescopic sight. Uh, FBI report from Hoover, letter. It is to be noted that at the time of firing these tests, the telescopic sight could not be properly aligned with the target since the sight reached the limit of its adjustment before reaching accurate alignment. As to the expertness of Oswald with the weapon, the last point made by Mr. Hoover, Oswald's last known score in the Marine Corps, fired 191, lists him as a rather poor shot, according to the testimony before the commission. Before that, uh, three years, two and a half years prior to that, he fired a little better, he fired 212. 191 is one point above the bare minimum for the lowest qualification of the Marine Corps. Okay, now we're going to have what the commission says is a test, quote, under conditions which simulated those which prevailed during the assassination. That's how the weapon's going to be tested by the commission. Oh, one minute to present the commission's case. Okay, number one, instead of a poor marksman or rather poor marksman, the commission chose the three best riflemen they could find in America. Number two, the commission said Oswald fired from a perch 60 feet above the ground. The experts fired from a tower 30 feet above the ground. Number three, the commission said Oswald fired at a moving target. The three experts fired at three stationary targets. Number four, the commission said Oswald was first shot because he fired as the car came from behind the oak tree, had its effect in less than eight-tenths of one second after the president became visible. The experts were told, take as much time as you wish for your first shot. Number five, the rifle was rebuilt with metal shims in order to straighten out the scope and keep it from wobbling at the time it's fired. And the three experts fired. Uh, they each tried the test twice for a total of 18 shots at large stationary targets with this improved weapon, taking as much time as they wanted. Not one of the 18 shots, not one, hit the head or neck portion of the target. The commission said Oswald, under different circumstances, more difficult circumstances, struck the president in the head and neck twice out of three shots. But of the 18 shots taken, and two of the experts in their four efforts couldn't come close in terms of the time even, but in terms of the accuracy, not one of the 18 shots struck the portion. What did the commission say? Just one sentence. What did the commission say about this conclusion? The commission concluded that the test showed that Oswald and his weapon contain the capability to fire as they did on November 22nd, to fire two shots into the president's head and neck area in that short period of time. If the rifle could not do it, and remember the rifle was used as proof that Oswald was guilty, if the rifle could not do it, what happens to the commission's case against Oswald as the lone assassin with that weapon? Thank you, Mr. Lane. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Mr. Lieber, you now have 12 minutes. <coughs> it is it has been difficult to make a considered judgment of the wave of criticism of the Warren Report which has been sweeping the country. Very few people have either the time or the abiding interest to delve into the report and the 26 volumes of evidence on which it is based. But that must be done. It is not possible to judge the conclusions of the report on the basis of the critical literature alone. Before going to specifics, I want to make clear my own personal views on a number of points. I think that much of the receptiveness to criticism of the report is part of a much more widespread lack of faith in government. We, d 
We do, not, we do not know what to believe when we hear that we are attempting in good faith to negotiate a settlement in Vietnam, or that the governor means no harm to the University of California. <laughs> the Warren Report is a convenient object against which we can direct the frustrations that we all rightly feel as a result of the so-called credibility gap. Unlike other government agencies, its sole function was to tell the people the truth about a tragic event. Unlike other government agencies, the 26 volumes of evidence that it published provide a test by which its performance can be judged. If the critics can show from these volumes that the conclusions of the report were wrong, the distrusted establishment will have been dealt a body blow. There is no doubt that in some ways the Commission deserves criticism. Most serious is its failure, primarily out of respect for the wishes of the Kennedy family, to make the autopsy photographs and x-rays a part of its record. Let me be very clear that I do not doubt the autopsy report, but the Commission's handling of the photographs and x-rays has permitted doubt where there could have been certainty. The staff wanted the photographs and x-rays at the time, and in view of the public doubts that have since been raised, I think they should be made available to an independent panel of pathologists as soon as possible. Some of the, fo <laughs> Some of the former staff members, including myself, have been working to achieve that result. But the Commission's admitted mistakes have been blown up all out of proportion to their real significance. In this case, for example, the nature of the President's wounds is quite clear from the autopsy report and the testimony given under oath by the pathologists before the Commission. They testified at that time that a review of the pictures would not cause them to change any of the testimony they gave before the Commission. The photographs and x-rays are now in the archives and they will be and are available under terms established by the Kennedy family. I have not yet heard Mr. Lane suggest that Robert Kennedy is a part of the conspiracy that he seems to see on all sides. It is, it is, generally, known, it is generally known that I have criticized the Commission when I thought that it was wrong. I will continue to do so. Most of my criticism has involved matters of judgment or procedure, and none of them has called into question the basic conclusions of the report. I believe that those conclusions are correct, and they must be judged by the evidence developed by the most extensive murder investigation ever conducted, and against the almost two and a half years of work by the critics. Let us turn to that evaluation. As Dr. Bernstein pointed out, the Commission concluded that the shots that killed the President and wounded the Governor were fired from the sixth floor of the School Book Depository. It also concluded that they were fired by Lee Harvey Oswald, and it was unable to find any evidence of a conspiracy. No one seriously contends that no shots were fired from behind the motorcade, and the evidence of this is overwhelming and should be compared with the evidence that the critics set forth to suggest that shots were fired from the grassy knoll. There were six eyewitnesses that saw something in the window at the time the shots were fired. Two of them actually saw the shots fired. Two others saw the rifle. Two others saw profile and movement that they immediately associated with the firing of the shots. I know of no such evidence with respect to the grassy knoll or anywhere else. There were three people on the fifth floor of the building. They were directly under the assassination window. They heard the shots and they even heard the shell casings hit the floor, because as a matter of fact, the floor was under construction at that time. It had been torn up, and there were, there were strips, holes you could see right through the floor. They testified that the whole building shook when the shots were fired. rifle and three shell casings were found in the sixth floor. The rifle was found by Seymour Weitzman and Mr. Boone, who was a deputy sheriff. Mr. Weitzman was a deputy constable. Mr. Lane has made a point, he hasn't raised it this morning yet, a point of the fact that Mr. Weitzman initially identified the rifle as a Mauser. 
I talked to Mr. Weitzman on the phone yesterday, and he testified before the commission, before Mr. Ball, as a matter of fact, and he said, yes, it was a Mauser. A Mauser is a Mauser, he said. He thought it was a German Mauser, but he'd never, he never handled the rifle, and in fact, it turned out to be an Italian Mauser. And he said that he was absolutely certain that the rifle that he found on the sixth floor of that building was the rifle that the Dallas Police Department took into their possession, and is the rifle that the commission concluded was the rifle that assassinated the president. president. He has no doubts about that whatsoever. The rifle was associated with the three shell casings that were found right near the sixth floor. And with bullets, bullet fragments, and a bullet, the bullet was found on Governor Connolly's stretcher in the hospital, and the fragments were found in the car, in the presidential limousine. And Mr. Lane has made the point that this rifle could, was not accurate enough or not rapid enough uh, to fire these shots, but the fact of the matter is that bullet fragments were found in the automobile that four experts testified were fired from this rifle to the exclusion of all other weapons. One of them, three of them were from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and one of them was from the Illinois Department of Criminal Investigation. The commission had examined the bullets and test bullets fired from the Mannlicher Carsano so as to verify the FBI finding. The same was true of the nearly whole bullet that was found. Also significant are the autopsy findings. The autopsy surgeons found that bullet was, the president was struck by two bullets. One was st struck him in the back of the head and it made a small entrance wound just to the right and that it exited at, on, on the right side of his head. They were able to tell with absolute scientific certainty by examining the way the bone broke under the impact of the bullet that the, the small wound in the back was a wound of entrance and that the wound, is the, the skull fragments associated with the large defect on the right side of the head were associated with a wound of exit. It was an exit wound. These, these uh, skull fragments and the portion of the skull were x-rayed and photographed, and those are photographs and x-rays I've already referred to them in the archives now. They also found, and I want to avoid semantic difficulty with this point, they also found, and I'll call this the first shot that struck the president, that he was struck 14, at a point 14 centimeters below his right mastoid process, which is the bony tip behind your ear, and that's five and a half inches, down and five and a half inches from the tip of his right shoulder, blade, shoulder joint is right here. I'm, I'm not going to say back or neck because that's a semantic problem we've had before, but the measurements are precisely set forth in the working notes of the autopsy surgeons and in the autopsy report and in their testimony under oath before the commission. They determined that that bullet penetrated through two shoulder muscles, bruised the top of his lung cavity, and passed out right below, right below the top collar button in the front. And the doctors testified that they were able to determine that the bullet had bruised the lung cavity with absolute certainty. And when the bullet passed out, it went on and it was undeflected and either struck someone else in the car or struck the automobile. We'll get to that later. The surgeons testified, the autopsy surgeons testified that the president was struck from behind and above. After we determined the source of the shots, it was determined, we examined the evidence that, that, that tended to identify the assassin. The rifle, the ownership of the rifle was traced uh, through the importer to a distributor in Chicago. And the night of the assassination, the FBI in Chicago went and found a roll of microfilm setting forth the records of rifle sales at Klein Sporting Goods Company. And right in the middle of a roll of microfilm was a purchase order, a money order, and an and, and and a invoice showing that a rifle, the rifle with this serial number, C2966, I don't remember the serial number offhand, was shipped pursuant to the order to a post office box in Dallas, that was, that, was, that was controlled and in the possession of Lee Harvey Oswald. And this evidence was right in the middle of a strip of microfilm. It would have been impossible for that evidence to have been forged in any way. The rifle also had a palm print on it, and the palm print was identified as that of Lee Harvey Oswald. On the morning of the assassination, Oswald walked into the school book depository with a long brown package in his hand. There's been some question raised as to whether or not, because of the testimony of the two witnesses that saw him bring it in, whether that package was long enough to have contained the rifle. They thought it was shorter, but not long enough to, to have contained the rifle. But the fact is that a brown package, precisely matching the description that these people gave, except as to length, was found on the sixth floor, right near the southeast corner window. And that package had the palm print and the fingerprints of Lee Harvey Oswald on it. And it was long enough to contain the rifle. Now, one problem that I've always said with that is, if Oswald did not carry that brown package that morning, when did he carry it? Because it had his prints on it, and it had them exactly where you'd expect to find them, on the bottom, well, the way, from the description of the way he carried the rifle. He cupped it in his hand like this. 
and the prints were on the bottom of the rifle, the palm print and the fingerprint. Um, there were Oswald's prints were on the cartons, and one of the witnesses said that Lair identified uh, Oswald as having been the man that fired the shots, Mr. Brennan. But contrary to what the critics say, the commission did not rely on that eyewitness identification to show that Oswald was the assassin, but only to show that the shots were fired from that window. Then it was determined that Oswald killed Officer Tippett shortly after the assassination, and that is shown by the physical evidence alone. The shell casings that were found next to Tippett's body were fired from Oswald's revolver to the exclusion of all other weapons. That was testified to by the Illinois Department of Criminology and by the FBI. Oswald had the revolver in his possession at the time as he was arrested, and the ownership was traced to him through records precisely the same as those of the, revol of the, of the, uh, of the rifle. In addition to that, Oswald admitted that it was his revolver and that he had it in his possession at that time. Now, Mr. Lane has advanced a theory. He says that the shots came from the grassy knoll. Two shots came from the grassy knoll, according to the recent issue of Playboy magazine. A total of six shots were fired. The first one only went in a finger's length into the back, and it stopped. We've talked about the magic bullet, but now we've got the tired bullet. Another one came in the throat. The other one came in the throat, and it too stopped. Apparently, we've never seen it, we've never been able to find it. It's not in the body, and it's nowhere else. And the interesting thing about the bullet that came in the throat is, when it went in the throat, according to Mr. Lane, it bent the fibers of the president's clothing at the throat outward. Now, that's a bit of magic that even the commission hasn't been able to come up with. I don't know how that was possible. And also, Mr. Lane says that the shot that killed the president was fired from the grassy knoll, and that is proven by the fact that the president's head moved backwards and to the left at the time he was struck by the shot, frame 312 to 313. That is not so. My time is up. We'll discuss that point later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Liebler. Mr. Lane, you have nine minutes for rebuttal. I have found a statement by Mr. Liebler at long last with which I am in agreement. There is a credibility gap in this country. It is because your government lies to you that there is a credibility gap. There's nothing wrong with us in doubting that which has been told to us about Vietnam or about the Warren Commission report. The trouble is in the statements that are being made. They're not accurate, so we can't believe them. And that's what causes the gap. And that's why it would be a good thing to get some of the facts instead of relying upon the faith that is invested in the Chief Justice because of his good works in many other areas. Now, all the 26 volumes have been published, and that's the test of the Commission's case, Mr. Liebler states. Fine. Photographs and x-rays aren't there because of respect for the Kennedy family. Did the Commission, the Commission ever ask to examine the photographs and the x-rays? Never. Did the Commission ever ask, I see that Mr. Liebler has accepted my suggestion that there should now be a group of independent pathologists who examine the photographs and the x-rays. Excellent, but it's not happening. Is it out of respect for the Kennedy family that the commission members themselves would not look at the x-rays and the photographs? I hardly think that, that can be the reason. But that's not all that's missing from the record. That's a very small portion of the suppressed evidence. How about the Zapruder films? The talked about frame 312 and 313. That's part of a longer film made by Abraham Sapruta. Why are there frames missing there, which have not been published by the commission? And when the commission did get around to publishing, you know, 313 is the one which shows the effect of the bullet striking the president in the head, the fatal shot. Why did the commission then publish the two most important frames in terms of determining the direction of the president's head movement, two succeeding frames, 314 and 315, in a reverse way, calling 315, 314, and 314, 315. Just a mistake, said J. Edgar Hoover in the letter that he wrote to a student at UCLA who called this error to his attention. Just an error. Today, there are 1,555 reports in the National Archives referred to as the basic source materials relied upon by the Warren Commission. You cannot see a third of them. Classified for 75 years, according to the Assistant Director of the National Archives. Why? 75 years, he explains the date at which time it is presumed that no one alive today will then be alive. Therefore, no one alive today can be harmed by the disclosures in 75 years. Is that how a democracy works? What's in the National Archives, which we are not allowed to see now because it would upset us? If all of the evidence there shows Oswald did it and did it alone, why doesn't the commission parade it out? What else did the commission not publish? 
The commission did not publish the transcripts of the testimony of the witnesses before the commission. Look at volume one of the very early pages. Statement, the commission reserved the right to edit the testimony prior to, te prior to publication to improve its accuracy and clarity. Do you like those improved versions or would you like to see what the witness actually said? Well, you cannot see the original statement. Mr. Liebler said that it is the most extensive criminal investigation ever conducted. Yes, it is a very extensive investigation of every critic of the Warren Commission. That's where the efforts were. Go down to the National Archives, 35 files all about me. Every time I spoke at a university, including this one, there's a file in the National Archives. About two FBI agents were present, submitting 21 reels of tape of every single statement that I made. But I practically escaped scrutiny if you compare me with Joachim Justin, a German-born national, who wrote a very early, very critical book of the Warren Commission. One of the files in the National Archives is a document submitted to the Warren Commission by the CIA, listed as a basic source material relied upon by the Warren Commission. What is it? A Gestapo file. The Gestapo prepared a file on Mr. Justin back in 1937. Can you imagine the Chief Justice pouring over the Gestapo file to pass upon the political reliability of one of the Commission's critics? Yeah, they conducted an extensive investigation. They didn't call Mr. Brehm. Mr. Brehm was just the spectator who was closest to the limousine when the bullet struck the President's head. He was on television on November 22nd. He said, and it's reported, I think, on page 12 of the Bruin issue, which discusses uh, what some of the witnesses at the scene said. The Bruin could find it, but the Warren Commission couldn't. <laughs> he said something to the effect that the effect of the bullet upon the president's head led him to believe that the shot came from beside the president or from in front, but not from behind the president. Well, that's not the kind of thing you want to trouble a Warren Commission with when their position is all the shots came from behind. Brehm was never called as a witness by the commission, never questioned by Mr. Liebler or any of his colleagues, not one lawyer for the Warren Commission. But Professor Oliver was questioned. Now, Professor Oliver is a very important man. He was in Illinois when the shots were fired. He was a man who recently resigned from the Birch Society, claiming that it was too liberal an organization, you may recall. <laughs> he wrote a long article. The commission published 80 pages. 80 pages of those 26 volumes are devoted to the rantings and ravings of Professor Oliver. For example, this is a theory, he says, which must be considered. President Kennedy was part of the international communist conspiracy, and he decided to turn American. And that's why the international conspiracy struck him down. Says Professor Oliver, I do not accept that theory because there is not one shred of evidence to indicate that President Kennedy ever decided to turn American. <laughs> what did your commission do then? They called Professor Oliver from Illinois to come and testify about his theories before the commission. Hour after hour after hour, Professor Oliver was there. He testified for more time than Mr. Weitzman, who Mr. Liebler has made reference to, who only found the rifle, who's found a portion of the president's skull in the street. He testified for more time than the most important witnesses combined to the events which took place in Dallas on November 22nd. So Brehm instead, Oliver instead of Brehm. Well, we don't see the photographs and the x-rays. Not allowed to see that. But it's not that the commission has no interest in medical material. Not at all. The commission published, for example, the dental chart, chart showing the condition of Jack Ruby's mother's teeth in 1937, which I have suggested would not even be relevant if it was charged that Ruby bit Oswald to death. <laughs> Mary Woodward, who took a photograph of the presidential limousine as it came in the Dealey Plaza, and in the background, she said, she caught the book depository building just at about the time the, shots were, the first shot was being fired. And she said there was the sixth floor window present, a Polaroid shot taken from her by a Dallas sheriff, given to a Secret Service agent. They both filed reports and both said they had the document. Have you ever seen the document? No, and you can't see it by reading the 26 volumes. That's the end of the story. The photograph of the sixth floor window taken, presumably at the time the very shots were being fired, has never been published by the Warren Commission. It has never been referred to by the Warren Commission. But the Commission published two photographs of me to show to Helen Louise Markham, who said that with whom I had a telephone conversation. Never met her. I had a telephone conversation. They published two pictures of me to show to Mrs. Markham to see if she could identify me as the person with whom she spoke on the telephone. <laughs> a certain selectivity, I, I fear, in the Commission's handling of the evidence. The whole building, the whole school building shook when the shots were being fired. 
O.V. Campbell, the vice president of the company, was standing out in front of the building. He said he heard the shots. He thought they could not have come from that building, but from down the railroad yard near the grassy knoll and the wooden fence, right in front of the building. Mr. Liebler hasn't told you. 58 out of the 90 witnesses who were questioned, who were able to make a statement as to the origin of the shots, 58 out of the 90 said from behind the grassy knoll, from behind that wooden fence, that's where they believe the shots came from. The Capitol record, one of the greatest deceptions participated in by the media, in my view, says, after all, in the echo chamber of Dealey Plaza. Witnesses can't hear anything. It's an echo chamber. When did it become an echo chamber? Who said it was an echo chamber besides Capitol records? One witness testified, Mr. Bowers, from where I was, there is, a, there is an echo sound, and I couldn't tell whether the, where the shots came from, from the front or the back. One witness in 26 volumes and 552 witnesses made that statement. Did the commission conduct, conduct any acoustics tests to see if there was an echo? No. How about the witnesses standing just in front of the wooden fence who said the shots came from directly behind me, from right over my head? How about the, how about the Dallas police officer who ran behind the fence and said, I smell gunpowder behind the fence just after the shots were fired? Two-thirds of the witnesses said the shots came from there including the men, some of them standing just in front of the book depository building. Mr. Liebler tells you about the three men on the fifth floor. How about the other people in the book depository building, the majority of whom said the shots could not have come from this building? How about Vicki Adams there on the fourth floor instead of the fifth floor, and Mr. Wilson and others in the book depository building who took a very different position? Mr. Liebler presents the case as the commission did, one side, not all of the facts. I think we're entitled to far more than that. That was not supposed to be an advocate summing up. Now, Mr. Lane said that Capitol Records characterized Dealey Plaza as an echo chamber, and this was an irresponsible thing. He says, who said Dealey Plaza was an echo chamber? He says, well, Bowers said it was an echo chamber, but of course, Bowers is one of Lane's most important witnesses. And before I get to the echo chamber thing, let's just look at what Mr. Lane has done with Mr. Bowers. This is the kind of thing that goes on and on and on. I was on a television program with Mr. Lane in New York last fall, and at this time, I called to his attention the fact that in this book, he says, and we had this in a press release here this morning that we just put out. He said that the commission lawyer interrupted Mr. Mr. Bowers so that he couldn't tell him what he saw on the grassy knoll. And I pointed out, and, and he quoted a section of the, of the transcript from volume 6, page 288, where Mr. Ball was, was questioning Mr. Bowers. And Mr. Lane said, he quoted the thing, in fact, it says, uh, Well, he, he cut him off at a point where he said he, could, he asked him, could he identify what was, what was up there? And he said, no, nothing that I could identify, and there was a dash. And Mr. Lane said that this shows that Mr. Ball was cutting Mr. Bowers off. I pointed out to Mr. Lane at that time that Mr. Ball had asked Mr. Bowers five times on pages 288 and 289 of volume 6, and they're in the library, and you can go and look at it, what was going on three times specifically, what was going on in the grassy knoll, and Mr. Bowers wasn't able to say. Then at the end of the deposition, Mr. Ball asked him two more times in general terms, is there anything else you know about this? And Mr. Bowers said, no, nothing I can think of. Now Mr. Lane said that we didn't give Mr. Bowers a chance to tell what he saw. Now I don't know how you characterize that kind of thing, and I was perfectly willing to let it go the first time he did it in New York, but he did it again in Playboy magazine, exactly the same thing. And in the press release, we've got Mr. Lane's quote, and we've got the page of the testimony, and there it is. Ball asked him five times, and Lane says that Mr. Ball wouldn't let Mr. Bowers tell the truth. Well, Mr. Mr. Lane relies on Bowers for a, a puff of smoke or a flash of light in the grassy knoll to show that there was somebody firing from there. But in fact, even in Lane's book, Bowers says, I just couldn't identify. He said, maybe a puff of smoke or a flash of light, something I just couldn't identify. And he even says it in Lane's book. Now, Mr. Bowers said that it was an echo chamber, and I can appreciate the fact that Mr. Lane's been too busy going around the country making speeches to take a look at the record, but I refer him to volume 7, page 535 the testimony of Mr. Smith, a Dallas policeman. And he says, and I read to you, Mr. Smith, I started up toward this book depository after I heard the shots. Strange. And I didn't know where the shots came from. I had no idea because it was such a ricochet. Mr. Liebler, an echo effect, Mr. Smith. Yes, sir. Now there's one more for you, Mr. Lane. I'm sure that you won't remember that when you speak again, but there's just one more for you. Now, Mr. Lane says, that he testified before the commission that the ammunition was of poor quality. Yes, he did. He said two newspaper men told him that. They went out and bought a few bullets, and they fired them off, and they said it didn't work. 
Now, when he puts it, when he writes his book, he says, "Yeah, the, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, when uh, when the uh, when he, when, he test, when he wrote his book, he said, said the same thing again. He's got a footnote. This is one of his 5,000 perfect footnotes. And what's the footnote? It's to his own testimony before the commission, where he tells the two newspaper reporters, told him that, and then he told the commission. That's his evidence for that. Now, on page 555 of the report, we, we find the following. Quote, the cartridge is very dependable. In tests run by the FBI and the Infantry Weapons Evaluation Branch of the U.S. Army, the C-2766 rifle was fired with this Western Cartridge Company ammunition over 100 times with no misfires. In contrast, some of the other ammunition available on the market, apparently the ones that Mr. Lane's friends got, for this rifle is undesirable or of very poor quality. Now, the fact of the matter is that in another section of the report that was done by a historian and not a lawyer, he does make the statement that that ammunition is being manufactured currently. And that is not the case. There's no question about it. In that sense, to that degree, the report is an error. But there are two other places in the report where it's discussed, and that claim is not made. And, and, the, and the basic problem here is whether the ammunition is reliable or not. And over 100 shots were fired by it, and there wasn't a single misfire on the whole event. Unless, of course, we're going to rely on Mr. Lane's newspaper friends that he told us about under oath before the commission. Now, he wants to know whether the commission asked for the photographs and x-rays. Yes, the commission did ask for them. And the, and the then Attorney General declined to give them to the Commission because he didn't want the family to have them in the record because of personal reasons. They did not want those things a part of the record. And that, as a matter of fact, uh, is made perfectly clear by, by it was in minutes of the commission, commission hearings, which, unfortunately or fortunately as the case may be, are not available in the archives at this point. Perhaps they should be. I think they should be. They're not. But they did ask them, and the correspondence is, is also in the, in, the, uh, in the record, and that is being released by the archives right now. They're reviewing it currently. You want to know where the missing Zapruder frames are. There are four missing Zapruder frames, and everybody is all concerned about that, and there's no question about that we should be. What happened was when Mr. Zapruder, who took the, the motion pictures of the parade, discovered that he had the, uh, the motorcade in this film, he went with the Secret Service, and they, they developed the original. They made three copies right then and there. So now we've got in, in existence one original and three copies. Life magazine bought the original and kept one of the copies. Two copies were turned over to the Secret Service. One of them was given to the FBI. When the commission started its investigation, we used the FBI copy to do our investigation or analysis, analysis of the Zapruder film. After that, we brought his life bring down the original and examined the original. And then we asked life to make blow-ups, four by six blow-ups, so that we could examine them in detail. During the time, between the time that life brought the original film down and the time that they made the blow-ups, and I know I'm going to get a laugh when I tell you this because it's absolutely unbelievable. Life magazine, who paid almost $500,000 for this picture, for this, for this roll of film, was working with the original in our laboratory, and some guy dropped it on the floor, reached to grab it, and he crushed those four frames, and they cut them out. Now, I know you laugh, but I put it, I put it to you bluntly. I've talked, to this, I've talked about this to the editors of Life magazine time and time again, and I have said to them, since you have such an interest in the work of the commission, and since you published Governor Connolly's speculations about this, and some of the Zapruder films, why don't you have the moral courage to tell the American people in your editorial column that you broke the film and lost those four frames? Well, they haven't done it yet, but I suggest that someday they're going to get their nerve up and they're going to do it. And I'm perfectly willing to stake my, my whole case on that one fact, and you can check it out any way you want to, but it's a fact. Now, even though the original was broken, copies were in existence. And we, they were in the possession of the commission. We had the original, the first generation copy. One of the missing frames is frame 210. And as Mr. Lane well knows, frame 210 appears at another place in the report. Now he's going to say, yes, but it isn't complete. Part of it's been cropped off. This is an example of how the commission suppresses evidence. Yes, Mr. Lane, part of it is cropped off. And while I don't expect you to believe me as to the reason why it's cropped off, I'll tell you. When you take the original film and run it through the duplicating machine by which the, by the copy is made, the material between the sprocket holes on the original does not come off on the copy, because what you get on the copy is exactly the same thing you get when you project the film. Now, not all cameras pick up the material between the sprocket holes. Zapruder's camera did. When the copy was made, that material that was not reproduced on the copy, and since the original frames have been destroyed, the material between the sprocket holes is simply not in existence, and that's why it's, that frame is not in the report, because we didn't have the original, we had to put a copy in. Now, you can comment on the ways of the world, and maybe it would have been better for the commission to have demanded life to turn that film, the original film, over to it, and maybe the commission wouldn't have broken it. I don't know if Mr. Lane has that much faith in this or not, but in any event, Life magazine did. Now, I'd like to ask Mr. Lane, since he, 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 he 
talks a lot about the, the Chief Justice and the veracity of the Chief Justice, Justice and that kind of thing. Let's get down to the basic facts here. If the shots came from the grassy knoll, where are the bullets? If there are six shots fired, where did they go? How did the shot come into the, into the president's throat and bend the cloth fibers outward, Mr. Lane? Can you explain that to us? Or is it just simply a fabrication on the part of the commission? I expect so. Now, as far as Mr. Brem is concerned, Mr. Lane uses Mr. Brem to show once again that the shots came from the grassy knoll and not from the school book depository. Let me quote from a, from a conversation that I had with Mr. Brem the other day in which I tape recorded with his permission. Quote, <coughs> My belief, my belief, and if I had to die on a spot for my belief, is that those two shots came from the same place. I couldn't pinpoint it, but they came from what was established as the window. There were no shots from anywhere else. Every question that he, Mark Lane, asked me, I indicated that the shots came from one place, up at the school book depository, that there was no doubt in my mind that this was the case. This was the way it was. I merely said to him, left and slightly to the rear, but I did not say to the rear. The shots did not come from the knoll. Well, Mr. Brem said this, I don't know. The nicest thing that can be said about Mark Lane is that he was an unmitigated liar. And that's Mr. Brem's words. We now move to re-rebuttal. Mr. Lane, six minutes. That's very nice talk with which to uh, participate in a debate to determine who killed our president three years ago. But because, I beg your pardon, but because um, this debate will be reported quite uh, prominently perhaps in the press, radio and television, I would like that it not be just the gentlemen of the press, as honest as they generally are, who can afford to the American people, to those who read the newspapers or watch radio or television coverage, exactly what the response of this audience was. So I'm just going to ask you this question. Will all those who believe now, before I begin my new book, excuse me, we're taking a survey, is that all right? Those who believe that Oswald's guilt as the lone assassin has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Will you raise your hands, please? Oh, you can abstain. We'll come to that next. Thank you. Will all those who believe that Oswald's guilt as the lone assassin has not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, raise your hands, please. Well, you're watching that, gentlemen. Let's see that in the newspapers tomorrow. Okay. <clears throat> I'm glad to see that Mr. Liebler is... Uh, Oh, do you want to abstain? All those who abstain. That's right. Very good. Well, you better find out he was your president and they killed him. You better get the, the position on it one way or another. That's to those of you who abstain. I'm glad to see that Mr. Liebler is reading Playboy magazine. Uh, so, so, so carefully. Mr. Liebler said that Bowers are my own witness. Or what my witness? I don't have any witnesses. He was a witness who testified before the commission what he said was inconvenient to the commission's case. That makes him my witness, I suppose. My own witness said that Dealey Plaza is an echo chamber. That statement is totally false. He never made that statement. He said from the position where I was at the time the shots were fired because of echoes which reached me at that point, I could not tell whether the shots came from the right or from the left. He made no general statement regarding the echo chamber. Now we hear about a patrolman who ran to the book depository building. How about the 17 deputy Dallas sheriffs? 17 of them who ran directly past the book depository building. 17 of them ran past the book depository building, right on to the grassy knolls, concentrated their efforts there. How about the fact that within five minutes, according to Bowers, between 15 and 100 policemen, federal and local agents, were behind that wooden fence on the grassy knoll, and that's where the attention centered. We hear just of one police officer. Now I'm told that my, my footnotes are of a poor quality because I quoted myself. Well, the point is this, and let me read you from the book precisely what I said so you can take this in context. Page 121 of Rushed Judgment. I told the commission, I told the commission that information from various sources indicated the ammunition available for the weapon was old and therefore of questionable reliability. Footnote. 
Well, how can I prove that I told the commission that unless I footnote it to my own testimony? That's not offered as proof that the, that the ammunition is unreliable, but proof that I did say that to the commission. Then we deal with the fact. How do I prove the, the evidence is unreliable, the ammunition is unreliable? Not because the reporter told me or not because I said it to the commission. I quote the manufacturer of the ammunition who says that clearly. The commission never quoted the manufacturer. The commission had its FBI agents test some ammunition. I was supposed to rely upon that. But I never used my own citation to prove anything other than that I had told that to the commission. Therefore, the question was raised, and that's why the commission placed that in the speculation and answered it with their finding, which was untrue, as we've seen just a little earlier. Now, Mr. Liebler said, the commission did ask for the photographs and the x-rays. Mr. Liebler was assigned to a rather peripheral portion of the investigation dealing with Oswald's background, not the medical aspect. Our inspector, the attorney, who was a very inventive attorney who created the single bullet theory, now the district attorney of Philadelphia, said that the commission never asked for the photographs and the x-rays. Mr. Liebler says that his colleague on the commission in charge of that area of investigation was entirely in error. I don't know which one of them was wrong. I just think that we're entitled to have better information than quarrels among commission counsel on such a relevant question. Now, <laughs> Mr. Liebler really asks too much, too much. He asks Life magazine to show its moral courage. Well, <laughs> by telling the truth about what happened to some of the most essential evidence in this case, I asked the Warren Commission to tell us the truth. If they know that the evidence was destroyed by life accidentally, somebody stepped on it or picked it up, I didn't quit that whole explanation, and four frames got crushed accidentally, why doesn't the commission tell us that? Why didn't the commission tell us that? Wasn't the commission interested? If you read some of the correspondence between Mr. Liebler after the event and others, you will see that Mr. Liebler himself said in a letter to commission counsel, Mr. Rankin, that he did not know that the commission had not published or had seen the entire Zapruder frame. He didn't know that. He said that rather recently, about a year ago. Now, all of a sudden, he knew it all along. He knew those four frames were missing. Somebody stepped on them at Life magazine. And then he says he knows you're not going to believe it. <laughs> where are the six bullets? Where did six come from? Well, where are the six bullets, Mr. Liebler said? I don't know. He said, well, how come they weren't found in the body? I'll tell you what. Let's go look at the x-rays and see if the bullets were found in the body. Can we look at the x-rays? No. Well, let's read the first statement, the autopsy draft notes made by Commander Humes, who conducted the autopsy. Can we do that? No. Volume 17, page 48, I think. This is to certify that I destroyed my draft notes on the autopsy by burning. They were just excess material, just historic documents, which belonged to all of us. They were not his notes. So we can't look at that. What do we have left in terms of a contemporaneous note? Is that one minute? No, no. Oh, OK. And then let me just finish the one sentence then. What are the, what are the contemporaneous notes? Two FBI agents, Siebert and O'Neill, who were present when the autopsy was conducted, who said the bullet entered the president's back, not neck, back, below the shoulders. The command humes probed it with his finger, said the bullet had gone in but a very short distance. There was no point of exit. And after making contact with Parkland Hospital and getting further information, Commander Humes testified, quote, the pattern is clear, close quote. The bullet went in but a short distance and did not exit. That's the bullet which now no longer went in the back, but up at the neck and exited at the throat. Commander Humes didn't know it at the time when he conducted the autopsy. It was discovered sometime later when the government's case was more uh, jailed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lane. Mr. Liebler, six minutes. I hope that you listen closely to what Mr. Lane says, because it's interesting, and to what I said, because I don't recall that I said that I knew all along that the frames were broken and had been destroyed by Life magazine, because I certainly didn't know it all along. That's quite true. I discovered it at Christmas time when I was in the office of Life magazine in New York, and I said, where are the four frames? And they got very red in the face, and they said, well, Mr. Liebler, and they told me the story. He's quite right. This problem was called to my attention at the time, uh, last fall, uh, a year ago last fall, and I did write to Mr. Rankin, and I said, where are the four frames? And I don't think Mr. Rankin knew either, because as a matter of fact, when life at that point 
the basic commission analysis of the Zapruder film had been completed from the materials that we had, and the copies were made by Life magazine, one, for further analysis, and two, to, to make copies that went into the report. And I don't think that anybody noticed at that time, I know I didn't, and I know Mr. Rankin didn't, that the four frames were missing. And if we had noticed it, we would have put the copies in the volume. Now, I admit that. There's no question about it. But if that proves that the conclusions of the Warren Commission are wrong, then that that's quite, comes as quite a surprise to me. Now, Mr. Lane said that Mr. Bowers didn't make a general statement about the, uh, about the echo chamber. Let me read you from page 287. Volume 6 of the Commission hearings. Mr. Ball, can you tell me now whether or not, or not it came, the sounds you heard, the three shots, came from the direction of the depository building or the triple underpass? Now, this is an example, of course, of Mr. Ball leading the witness to prove the government's case. Where'd they come from, the depository or the triple underpass? Mr. Bowers, no, I could not. Mr. Ball, from your experience there, previous experience there in hearing sounds that originated at the Texas School Book Depository Building, did you notice that sometimes those sounds seem to come from the triple underpass? Is that what you told me a moment ago? Mr. Bowers, there is a similarity of sound because there is a reverberation which takes place from either location. Mr. Ball, had you heard sounds originating near the triple underpass before? Yes, quite often. Mr. Bowers, yes, quite often because trucks backfire in various occurrences. And had you heard, Mr. Ball, and had you heard noises originating from the depository building when they were building there? Mr. Bowers, yes, they were renovating. I did carpenter work as well as sandblasting on the outside. They, they did carpenter work as well as sandblasting on the outside of the building. Now that, I don't know what a general statement is, but that seems like a pretty general statement. And Mr. Bowers indicated clearly that there was an echo chamber effect there, and he worked in that tower for 12 years, so I expect he had plenty of time to observe it. Now, Mr. Lane wants to know where the six bullets came from. Mr. The, the six bullets came from the statement that Mr. Lane made in Playboy magazine last week, and he outlined what the six bullets were. One, the shot that went in a finger length, and he doesn't tell us what happened to it. That's shot one. Shot two is the one from the knoll that entered the throat, bending the fibers outward. And I asked Mr. Lane the last time to tell me how the fibers got bent outward when the bullet went in, but he didn't tell us, and I'd still like to have him tell us. That's shot two. Shot three is the Connolly bullet, which Mr. Lane apparently admits came from behind and wounded Governor Connolly. Shot three, shot, that's shot three. Shot four is one shot that missed. Shot five is the president's head shot. And shot six is the one that hit the sign. Mr. Mr. Lane speculates that a shot hit the sign. Well, there's the six shots, Mr. Lane. Now, please tell us where the bullet that entered the president's throat and bent the cloth fibers outward went, because it didn't exit and it wasn't in the body. And the autopsy surgeons testified to this under oath, and they examined the x-rays at the time they conducted the autopsy. In order to believe that there really this bullet exists in the body, you've got to believe that three autopsy surgeons are perjurers. But Mr. Lane doesn't boggle with that in the least bit, because after all, even though they're doctors and they're leaders in their field, one of them was in the Army and the other two were in the Navy. And of course, everybody knows that people in the Army and Navy lie, and they tell exactly what the government wants them to tell them. And I want to add a personal note on that. If we really believe that sort of thing, it's things in this country have come to a sorry state of affairs. Now, maybe I'm prejudiced about this. But I'm a professional man, and I'm a lawyer, and I don't make a habit of lying in any way. And I, <laughs> and I try not to lie at all. And I'm usually pretty successful, I think. Now, shot, I want to dwell on shot five. Now, I want to, I want to go, we'll get to this later on. I want to talk about Mrs. Markham. They, well, first I want to talk about something that happened here at UCLA when we were here before, when Mr. Lane and I met it over here in this other part. And Mr. Lane repeated this in Playboy, and he gave this as an example of my irresponsibility in a press conference just a minute ago. He said that when, uh, when I was asking Rena Oswald about this picture with the hole in it, uh, and, he, and he was complaining that the commission never asked about it, I don't know what in heaven's name he thought I was doing down there in Dallas with the picture, talking to Mrs. Oswald about it, if we weren't asking her about it. He said that, the, that there was a statement that went, said, off the record. And we have no idea. And I didn't remember what happened off the record. Of course I don't remember what happened off the record in, in one witness I examined three years ago, for heaven's sake. So Mr. Lane says that that's an irresponsible statement, that, 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 uh, that we went, we went off the record here. I didn't remember it. That's irresponsible. All right, well, let's, let's just go on. And he says it was never mentioned again. On page 295 of volume 11, we see the whole sequence. And Mr. Lane, we see the quotation. Off the record, please. Parenthesis. Quote, discussion off the record, discussion between Mr. McKenzie and Mr. Liebler to the effect that the picture might have been creased in the process of making a print from the original photograph. Close parenthesis. And then there's another, another eighth of a page in which Mr. McKenzie and I both asked Mrs. Oswald some additional questions about the, the hole in the photograph. Now, Mr. Lane says the question was never mentioned again. 
Apparently, he believed his own book again because he, he stops right there, too, in his book when it says off the record, please, and he leaves out the parenthetical discussion right in the record that, show, right in the record that shows what the off the record discussion was. And it's a perfect example of the technique that this man is using. And I just ask you to go and look at the volumes. I don't ask you to believe me. Just go and read them. Page 295, volume, volume 11. Now, he talks about Mrs. Markham in his Playboy interview. He said, and I quote, The only problem with Mrs. Markham, who was a witness to the Tippett shooting, is that on November 22nd, Mrs. Markham gave a statement to the police, which the press picked up, that the man who shot Tippett was short, heavy, and had bushy hair. Close quote. I quote now from Markham Deposition Exhibit 1, a transcript of a telephone conversation between Mr. Lane and Mrs. Markham. Quote, Mr. Lane. But, well, could you just give me one moment and tell me, I read that you told some of the reporters that he was short, stocky, and had bushy hair. Mrs. Markham. No, I did not say this. Lane, you did not say this? Markham. No. Now, Mr. Lane, why do you do things like this? Why do you say in your... That Mrs. Markham gave this and Mrs. Markham told you specifically that she didn't. And why do you say that we went off the record and we didn't go off the record? No, you may no. <laughs> we are now no hold hold your comment for your closing statement. We're now ready to accept questions from the audience. There is a microphone right over here, and anybody who has a question, come over here to this microphone. We will accept alternating questions, that is, one addressed to Mr. Lane and one addressed to Mr. Liebler, and so forth. They're going to respond to these questions using microphones when they're seated. What do you suggest? Let me, let me caution the questioners that no speeches will be permitted. Let's have the first question now and indicate to whom you wish this question addressed. Yes, I'd like to address this question to Mr. Lane. Uh, Mr. Lane, uh, would you please discuss the uh, allegations that have been made about the conflicting shadows in the photographs? The lines on the... Uh on the fence, on the, po the sign? Yes. These are the frames which have been deleted. They got crumpled on the floor of Life magazine. But uh, it was discovered by a student here, uh, graduate student of engineering, I believe, in an examination of the Sapruder frames that uh, Mr. Sapruder, of course, was in front of and to the right of the limousine. And between him and the present, at a certain period of time, as he was taking the photograph, appears a sign. Uh, and on the sign, uh, at the frames uh, which are just before those that are deleted and just after those which are deleted, those which have been published, you can see what appears to be lines running across the sign. Uh, and the lines appear as if you could see the whole sign, which you cannot, because the only place you could have seen the whole sign would be in those four frames which got <laughs> stepped on at Life magazine. But uh, in the other frames, you can see that the lines seem to converge at one point. You, at the point which appears to be, if you follow the lines further, the lower left-hand portion of the sign. But the lower left-hand portion of the sign is not visible, unfortunately. Excuse me, Mr. Lane, I'm not sure that this, that you are responding to the question that the questioner had in mind, and I think we ought to allow him to reframe it again. Perhaps, uh, perhaps I wasn't entirely clear. Well, let me just finish it now that I've got it, just take one second. And it has been... No, no, I think we ought to let him ask his question, and you no. should respond to his question. <laughs> yeah. No, I was referring to the photograph of Mr. Oswald holding the rifle. Oh. All right. That's why I asked you if you meant the sign. I thought you said yes. I'm right. sorry, I wasn't too okay. clear. Uh, talk about that photograph. The co cover, cover of Life magazine is a photograph which allegedly was found by the Dallas police among Oswald's possessions, and it shows a person who purports to be Lee Harvey Oswald holding a rifle in one hand and some newspapers in the other hand, and uh, there appears to be a disparity on the face of the photograph. That is, the, the shadow from the nose appears to fall directly down into the middle of the mouth, dividing that mouth quite in half, uh, indicating that someone was almost directly overhead when the picture of Oswald's head was taken. 
Unfortunately, however, for the uh, authenticity of the photograph, at least in terms of fast examination of it, the shadow from the body goes in an entirely different direction. It goes to the right and to the rear, indicating the sun was to the left front when the photograph was taken. There are several explanations for this. Uh, number one, it may have been that the photograph was taken in a society which enjoyed a dual solar system. <laughs> we cannot exclude any possibility. Another is that Oswald's head may have been superimposed on the photograph, or perhaps there is some other trick photography uh, trick which we don't understand, which just brought about these disparities. All I can tell you is that the Sunday Times of London gave this subject very close consideration in a massive article which it did on the case. Their own photographers uh, did what they could and said it was absolutely impossible to duplicate those two shadows without superimposing Oswald's head or someone's head on the body. Now this question was brought to the attention of the commission. I'm afraid if you look in my book you'll find that I did that and I made a, f a footnote indicating that I did as well. And uh, the commission was interested in this and gave this to Lyndall Shaney felt the photography director who examined the photograph to see if the rifle was in fact the rifle which was the assassination weapon. But in the midst of this he presented uh, another photograph which he had taken of an FBI agent on the roof of the FBI building. And the photograph was taken was published. And uh, the problem with this photograph is you can see very clearly the shadow from the body does simulate the shadow from the body which allegedly belonged to Oswald. It's a little difficult to tell if the shadow from the nose is the same though because they removed the head before they published the photograph. With Mr. Shaney felt explaining that uh, there's nothing about the head which was pertinent anyway and uh, somehow missing the point I fear and uh, in Mr. addition Blaine, to this I, he... I think, I think we ought to go on now. Let's, let's let Mr. Liebler have a crack at the answer to this question. Oh, all right. First, a couple of words. The reason that the picture on the roof of the Justice Department was taken uh, was to discover whether or not you could tell from looking at the rifle that was in the man's hand whether it was the same rifle that was in Oswald's hand in the picture. And it had nothing to do with the, with the juxtapositions of the shadows, and that's perfectly clear from the report. And Mr. Lane doesn't know that. I hope he'll do some research on it before he makes this speech again, because that's the fact. Now, second of all, Mr. Schoenefeld examined the, the photograph, and it's possible to tell uh, when you, if the photograph edges aren't cut uh, when they print it, which this one was not, to tell whether it was taken from a particular lens, the exclusion of all other lenses, just like the bullets from a rifle. And he testified that after having examined it, that this picture was taken from Oswald's camera to the exclusion of all of the cameras. Marina Oswald testified that she took the picture in the backyard of their apartment at Neely, Pla at Neely Place Street. Now, in addition to that, and this is kind of interesting in view of the dual solar system uh, argument, because I have a picture here that I want to show you. This will be here for you to examine afterwards if you can't see it now. Yeah, hold it up. Just a minute, I don't want to take the bottom off yet. Now I want you to, I want you, honestly you can't see it very clearly from here, but you want you to ex examine the nose, the nose shadow on this photograph, which is exactly the way the nose shadow was on the picture that Mr. L Mr. Lane just talked about. Pardon? Oh, it's lying to the left? Well, you can come up here and look at it afterwards. It's going almost straight downward, just as Oswald's did. We'll have another photograph to compare it to. Now, there's the body shadow. It doesn't go directly behind at all. It goes off to the side. And, this, if, and, and I may represent to you that this picture was taken right here in Los Angeles on Saturday. And if any of you saw two suns in the sky, uh, then you can subscribe to Mr. Lane's study about this picture. And I invite you to come up and look at it. Now, the only way... Why don't you stay here, Mr. Liebler? Well, our next question should be addressed to Mr. Liebler. Yes. Mr. Liebler, I have a question. Bullet number 399, the exhibit number for the Warren Commission, which supposedly did all the damage to President Kennedy, passed through Governor Conley into his wrist, into his thigh bone, and then fell out. This bullet supposedly did all this damage, and yet when it was examined, it was found to weigh 158 grams, which is exactly the amount uh, grains, which is exactly the amount of a, a virgin bullet which has not gone through any tissue, any bone at all. Now, the autopsy, pe the autopsy when it was performed, and the, the uh, doctors said that they found some let's, grains... Let's get to the question. Yes. The, some, so they found some grains well, of what the bullet is the question? in Conley. What's how do you explain that this is still a... How do you explain 
that this is still a virgin bullet if it did all this damage? Um, once again, you, you, uh, your facts are somewhat incorrect. The bullet weighed, as you say, and I accept that, 158 grains. That's approximately correct. The, the FBI fired a series of tests with, uh, with, uh, into cotton to get original bullets, and they weighed in the vicinity of 161 and a half grains. So that actually, 399 lost approximately three grains. Now, the, the, is, in the, way, the way it seems to me, and the way the, commission, the way the commission arrived at this conclusion is, that the bullet that entered the back of the president, 14 centimeters down from the right mastoid process, passed through and exited from his neck. It lost only about 200 feet of velocity during that period of time. It was still traveling quite rapidly, around uh, 1,700 feet per second, and it was not deflected. It went straight on forward down. It would have had either the car hit the car or hit somebody in the car. Now, Governor Connolly happened to have been hit at a place in his back that was exactly consistent with where he would have been hit if that bullet had passed through and struck him. Uh, and and uh, since the, the bullet didn't hit the car, that's pretty good evidence, it seems to me, that the bullet did hit Governor Connolly. Now, in terms of the condition of the bullet, it was tumbling when it went through Governor, after when it came from Governor Connolly, and there was testimony that when it struck his wrist, it was not a pristine bullet, and it apparently struck the wrist at an angle. And the doctors concluded that it probably hit his wrist going backwards, and hit, and hit, hit his wrist going backwards into the back of his wrist. Now, as a matter of fact, when those bullets are fired, and they found particles of lead in the governor's wrist, that, that, that they estimated it weighing approximately three grains, uh, and some of them estimated it less than that. Now, as a matter of fact, the only place that the bullet was a steel-jacketed bullet, 399, it had not been broken up to any substantial extent. The only place that anything could have come from that bullet is a, is a piece of extrusion on the end of the bullet that, is, that comes, on the bullet, gets, comes out of the bullet when it's fired. And that's lead, because it comes out of the center of the bullet. That part of 399 was broken off. It was gone. And, the, and it was lead fragments, and they found lead, lead fragments in the governor's wrist. Now, I, I suggest that you might be able to associate the fragments that they found with the extrusion that was broken off. Now, the commission ran a series of tests on this, and I know that people point out the fact that when the commission fired a pristine bullet into a wrist, nose on, it always flattened the nose of the bullet. No question about it. It was traveling very fast, it was a pristine bullet, and it always flattened the nose, quite unlike 399. But 399 at this point had already passed through the governor's chest cavity, the president's neck, and it spun into the, bullet, into, the, into the governor's wrist, most likely backwards, and it would not have deformed the nose, it was going slower. And in addition to that, the commission shot a bullet uh, from this rifle through a goat, through an anesthetized goat, and produced a fracture in the rib, very similar to the one in Governor Connolly's rib cage. Now, I don't mean to have uh, any comparison between, between the subjects involved in it. But as a matter of fact, if you look at that bullet, and it's bullet number 853, you'll find that it looks almost exactly like bullet 399. So that at least we know that you can fracture the rib cavity, do the damage that was done in the rib without deforming the bullet at all. And then if it hits backwards and goes on through, I, I, when you take all the evidence and put it together, the loss of weight is almost exactly what it would be, and, and, and it's somewhat more than the, than, the lead, than the lead that they found in the governor's body. The trajectory, the bullet didn't hit anything car, it went into the governor. The time sequence, which is very close, and the, the, they reacted very closely, and it seems most likely that that bullet did go through. It's not inconsistent at all. You want it? Do you want to comment on old 399? Oh, yes, I would like to comment on 399. First of all, uh, Mr. Liebler has misled you again. Dr. Olivier, who conducted the test, who fired the bullet through the goat's carcass, said, quote, that the damage done to the goat carcass, this is a quote, was very similar to the injury done to Governor Connolly's rib. He was then asked to describe the bullet which hit the carcass of the goat with the bullet which hit Governor Connolly, and he said, this bullet, the one which hit the carcass, has been quite flattened. Commission Exhibit 399 is almost completely unaltered. In terms of the bullet which went through the wrist of the uh, dead body, which was also a test, I don't, I'm not sure Mr. Liebler made reference to that, Dr. Olivier was asked to compare that bullet with the bullet which struck Governor Connolly's wrist, allegedly 399. Question, how does it compare, for example, with Commission Exhibit 399? Answer by Dr. Olivier, the Commission's expert. It is not like it at all. I mean, Commission Exhibit 399 is not flattened at the end. This one is very severely flattened at the end. That's an additional problem. But in addition to that, uh, the fact is this, that 399 weighs 158.6 grains. The doctors testified that it appeared that Governor Connolly had at least three grains of metal in his right wrist. If you take the heaviest bullet, bullets do vary in weight, take the heaviest bullet ever tested by the FBI, and which test was reported to the commission, subtract three grains from it, you still have too much material left in Governor Connolly's wrist. Now, how about the material in Governor Connolly's thigh? How about the fact the bullet went through the president's neck, allegedly? How about the loss of metallic material uh, in, the, in, the in the rib explosion, which shattered the fifth rib? 
by more than three grains of present in the wrist, forgetting the other uh, traumatic experiences that the bullet weathered. The fact is that bullet could not possibly have done it. The bullet was required by the commission because the pictures taken by Sapruta established how much time was required from the first shot to the last, how much time elapsed. And faced with that, the rifle was not capable unless one bullet was pressed into service to do double duty, pass through the president, him in the back of the neck, come out his throat, strike Governor Connolly. As to the fibers, which I've been asked about, when you bring a jacket in to be examined, the fibers are pointed in one direction rather than another direction, I would suggest to you that is not the best possible evidence. So I have to shake it and the fibers point in another direction. So it's really, oh, you think that's good evidence when you pick up a jacket and you can see when you examine it, the fibers go in one direction or another. That's absolute proof. I think that the absolute proof is the fact that 399, which is essential to the Commission's case, notwithstanding the Commission's evidence and statement, the Commission concluded that it is not essential to our case to show which bullet hit Governor Connolly. But I think even Mr. Liebler would concede that it is essential, that unless that bullet did the damage to both the President and the government, and to the governor, the whole government's case falls apart. The fact is that each of the doctors who was called upon to testify including the pathologist who Mr. Liebler has made reference to, Dr. Shaw, who, who uh, treated Governor Connolly, each of them said, when examining the bullet, I do not believe that that bullet could have done the damage to Governor Connolly. 399 could not have done the damage, said Dr. Shaw and others. And furthermore, Dr. Shaw, on November 22, 1963, held a press conference at, 40, at uh, 4.30 in the afternoon, about two and a half hours after Commission Exhibit 399 was recovered. And what did Dr. Shaw say at the press conference? The bullet which hit Governor Connolly remains in his thigh at the present time. It is there in his thigh. And that was two and a half hours after Darrell Tomlinson found what the commission calls Commission Exhibit 399 and wants us to believe that came from Governor Connolly's thigh. What happened to that videotape? Seized by the commission and never published. But Metro Media in New York City has it and has played it. And that's Dr. Shaw on there at 4.30 in the afternoon. Let's, let's have a question for Mr. Lane now. Uh, Mr. Lane, yes. uh, I know you claim that uh, Conley and Kennedy were hit by separate bullets and that uh, in frame 230 of the uh, Zapruder film, which is reproduced on page 3 of uh, the big issue of the Daily Bruin, uh, you say that Conley is not reacting, that Kennedy is clearly reacting and, Kennedy, and Conley hasn't been shot. But if anyone will look at this picture, Conley is reacting. His hand is, with his hat in it, is coming up off the seat and not only that, uh, you I didn't claim. Get the question. Well, the question is, you claim, and Conley was mistakenly claims that he was hit after this point. But as you can see, if you look at this picture, his hand is too high to have been hit in the back I'm of the sure wrist. I'm not sure I grasped the question, but I think well, I've all right. Well, let's have if you will let me quick, I'll, I'll ask you in one though. sentence. How can a bullet that comes out below the right nipple of Governor Conley go through the back of the wrist? when his hand is in such a high position as 230 shows without making a turn in air? And do you think a turn in air by a bullet is possible? Well, I don't think so. I don't think it's possible for a bullet to turn in air. That's why I do not believe that the bullet hit the president in the back of the neck, thereby leaving a wound lower in the shoulder. I don't believe the bullet then continued on out through the throat, leaving behind an entrance wound, as every doctor at Parkland Hospital described the wound, who made a statement on November 22nd. I don't believe the bullet then uh, if it did hit the, in the shoulder where Stephen O'Neill said, then the bullet, in order to make that wound at the throat, was ranging upward in the air. Somehow it was fired from the sixth floor, struck the shoulder, then went up in the air. And now we have the mid-air turn, but it's not mine, it's the commission's, because there the bullet somersaulted and then went down into the governor's back and came out through his chest, his wrist, ended up in his thigh, was in his thigh at 4.30 in the afternoon, but it was discovered at 2 o'clock on the uh, stretcher by someone else. The question... The, uh, the point I make in addition to that is this. It is not where I say Governor Connolly is hit that is relevant. It is what Governor Connolly says in examining those photographs. If there's any doubt in your mind about what Governor Connolly says, read Life magazine. They covered it very well. It has a whole front page cover. You've probably seen that issue. And it, it makes very clear Governor Connolly's statement that I heard the first shot. I know enough about hunting to know that a bullet travels more quickly then does the speed of sound. When I heard that shot, it had already hit. Then I turned to my right to see the president. I couldn't see him. Then I turned to my left to see the president, and then I was hit. And I was hit by the second bullet, and not by the same bullet which hit President Kennedy. And Governor Connolly's wife, seated to his left, said the same thing, but a little bit more explicitly, because she could view both men. She said, I heard the first shot, and then the president began to react. He had been hit already. 
Then John, her husband John Connolly, turned to his right to see the president. Couldn't see him, turned to the left, and then she said the next bullet hit him and knocked him down. Now, is Governor Connolly wrong? Is Mrs. Connolly wrong? Are the films wrong? I think not. I think that if you examine very closely what they said, you'll find that it corroborates everything except the commission's desperately needed conclusion, and that is that Oswald did it and did it alone in that period of time with that particular weapon. There's an interesting thread that runs through all of this, and Mr. Lane just very nicely put his finger on it, when he characterized this as the commission's desperately needed conclusion. Why did the commission desperately need to conclude that, that only one man did this and that all the shots were fired from behind? If there had been somebody on the grassy knoll, and if we had discovered any evidence of any shots from being fi fired from this direction, the commission would have been more than happy to, to indicate the fact that that was the case. Now. Now, as far as, as far as Governor Connolly's testimony is concerned and, and, the, and the sequence here, uh, the question of the timing is something that you can look at those films hour after hour. And it's a matter of judgment and it's a matter of disagreement. And uh, th that's all you can say about it. But when you put all the evidence together as to when the bullet came, where the bullet went when it came out of, the, out of the president's throat, the line, the trajectory is straight to the governor's back. And that bullet was not deflected um, and, it, and it didn't hit the car. Now, an essential to this whole one bullet theory, of course, is the idea that the bullet passed downward through the president's neck like this. And Mr. Lane tries to create doubts by indicating that some, that some FBI agents and Secret Service agents said that the bullet struck the president in the back. Well, against that, you have to compare what the doctors said. They, they said that the bullet struck the president 14 centimeters from his right mastoid process and 14 centimeters from the tip of his right acromion process. Now, if you want to believe two FBI agents' statement that the bullet hit him in the back, and I really don't know where the back is, but I do know where 14 centimeters below my right mastoid process is, then you're going to have to believe this. But Mr. Lane says, but the autopsy surgeons testified that the bullet came through, passed downward, and they were able to determine with absolute certainty that it had bruised the top of his lung, and then, it, and then it exited from his throat. Now, that's a straight line right through the president's neck, and then the bullet went on to strike Governor Connolly. As far as Governor Connolly's movements are concerned, uh, or his, his testimony that he wasn't struck. And Mr. Lane makes a, there's a nice subtle, subtle play here. Mr. Lane first says, the governor said, I wasn't hit by the first shot because I heard the first shot. I turned around, I couldn't see the president. And then that has changed very nicely into, I couldn't have been hit by the same bullet that hit the president. But that's entirely consistent with the proposition that the first bullet did not hit the president. And the commission didn't conclude whether the first bullet hit him or not. Governor Connolly heard the first shot, he turned around. He didn't see the president and he didn't know whether he was hit or not. The shot was fired. If it missed, he turned back around. The second shot was fired. It went through the president's neck and hit Governor Connolly. Now, that's a possible explanation of what happened. It's not possible to tell for certain. It not, was not possible for the commission to tell, and it is not humanly possible for anyone to tell, because you just can't find facts with that degree of certainty, and that's just all there is to it. You can have 27 investigations. It won't help you. I want to make one more point. Governor Connolly testified that he was absolutely aware of everything that happened in that car from the time the first shot was fired until the time he, he lost consciousness. Well, the fact of the matter is that the governor didn't know that he'd been struck in the rest in the thigh until he woke up in the hospital the next morning. Now, if you want to take that and believe that he was aware of everything that happened, then you'll just have to do it. He didn't even know he was struck by the bullet. All right, can we have another question for Mr. Liebler now? Uh, yes, Mr. Lane has stated that 58 of the 90 witnesses stated that the bullets came from the area of the grassy knoll. I wonder if Mr. Liebler would, uh, would comment on this and why these 58 witnesses went wrong. Well, I think they said, as a matter of fact, that, that from the sound, they, from the sound of the shots, they thought the shots had come from the grassy knoll. Um, and we've, we've already discussed the whole echo pattern here, and that's, that's the only explanation I have for, for that. The fact of the matter is that Lee Bowers, who was in the railroad tower behind the uh, grassy knoll, uh, behind the grassy knoll, behind the fence, was standing up there, and he didn't see anybody fire a shot. And nobody saw anybody fire a shot from that area. And the police were up there within seconds after the shots were fired. Clyde Haygood drove his motorcycle up there and ran up and looked. There wasn't anybody there. Couldn't find anybody. And there, was no, there were no shell casings and nobody was seen there with a rifle. Now, in addition to that, the autopsy report indicates, you can always hypothesize that somebody was there and was firing. But if he was firing, he didn't hit anybody. And that's shown, one, by the autopsy report, which shows conclusively that all the shots that hit the president, and the president were fired from behind. And also by the fact 
Um, and I, I, my notes on this are over there because I wanted to read from what it says in the, in the latest issue of Ramparts in this article in the Daily Bruin. But I can, I can remember it fairly well. Mr. Lane argues that what the, the fatal shot came from the grassy knoll because at the crucial frames, 312, 313, the president's head was, sh was thrust sharply backwards into the left. Now, Dr. Riddle, who is a professor in the physics department here, has apparently at the, at the uh, request of Ramparts did a study of these recruiter frames. And, it's, and he reports on his study, and he reports in, in Ramparts and in the Bruin. And he says, at frames 312 and 313, the president's head moved downward. Now, that's what Dr. Riddle says, and that's what the Bruins article says. This is the, the Lifton uh, Welsh article in the Bruin Rampart. As a matter of fact, we, 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 I called the head of the physics department the other day and asked him to send someone over to examine the Zapruder films. I, and he sent somebody over. I'd never seen this fellow before in my life. He came in, he went through the Zapruder films, and I said, go and look at him and tell us what you find. And he came back and he said, well, golly, he said, you know, at the, the crucial frame here, and we're talking about a physical reaction, is the difference between frame 312 and 313, because a physical reaction is instantaneous. The minute you hit it, it moves. And he said, the shot uh, at 313 and 312, 312 and 313, the head moves downward. It goes like this. The head was like this, and it goes like this. And this is what Dr. Riddle says, and this is what Mr. Lifton says. Now, the fact of the matter is, and there's an interesting footnote that it, in there that says that the movement of the head from 312 to 313 is consistent with a shot fired from a 25 degree elevation from the direction we posited. All right, they posited the grassy knoll, and they said that the movement of the head at the crucial point is consistent with a shot fired from a 25 degree elevation. Well, do you know where that is? It's either up in the trees. Now, Mr. Lane hasn't produced an a, a witness yet that said that there was a helicopter yet there or a flying saucer. But maybe they'll have to find one now, because the physical evidence that they've developed and has been confirmed by our independent investigation shows that the head moved downward like this. And that is consistent, not at all consistent. It's absolutely inconsistent with a shot fired from the grassy knoll, but it is consistent with a shot that struck the president in the back of the head that was fired from the direction of the school book depository. And I invite you to go back and read that issue of the Bruin and see for yourself. I don't know, sir, if I should address myself to the subject matter of your question or to the subject matter of Mr. Legal's answer, but uh, I'll do both, perhaps. Question. 58 out of 90. Mr. Uh, Liebler said, well, echo chamber again. But again, we have Mr. Bowers saying echo chamber, but again, Bowers never said echo chamber. Never said echo chamber. From where he was, it seemed he couldn't tell. That was the... How about someone right in front of the wooden fence? Could he tell if it came from a place many yards away or just behind him? Where did you get the 50 out of 90? You found them in the works of the critics of the commission because there is no list ever published by the Warren Commission in its 26 volumes indicating what the witnesses on the scene thought. Never is there such a list published by the commission. It was compiled by us. It was compiled by the commission critics who went through the 26 volumes and picked out all the material and put up a list and footnoted. Why didn't the commission let you know that 58 out of the 90 thought it came from there and then say it was an echo chamber? They just spoon-fed you with that which they wanted you to hear and never told you that the majority of the witnesses, 50 out of 90, took that position. Now, uh, in addition to Bowers, he didn't just say that he, uh, or the other witnesses didn't just say they heard something come from there, assuming that it was an echo chamber. Would that account for the fact that seven men on the grassy, on the wooden fence, on the uh, railroad bridge overlooking the grassy knoll? Seven would say they saw puffs of smoke. That's not an echo. How about Bowers himself? It's true that he said that he couldn't tell from sound where the shots came, came from, but he said just before the shots were fired, there were two men behind that wooden fence. At least one of them was there just after the shots were fired, and when the shots were fired, his attention was directed to that fence, and he said, I saw something there out of the ordinary, something which attracted my attention, which I could not identify specifically, but it was a puff of smoke or a flash of light at the time the shots were fired. Why didn't Mr. Liebler tell you that? And why didn't the Warren Commission tell you that's what Mr. Bauer said? Now we hear from 312 to 313. How much time that is? One eighteenth point three of a second. Less than an eighteenth of a second. That's how we're going to determine how the president moved from those two frames. How about 312 to 321? We're dealing now with a half a second. Can we see what happened to the president? He was leaning forward in this position at frame 312. And in this position at frame 313, then the bullet hit him. Within half a second, he was driven sharply to the rear and to the left. His head went in this direction. Forget about 312 to 313 in terms of, but no, in terms, in terms of what happened before the shot was fired. Is that what you're interested in? 
what the president was doing before the shot was fired or what happened from 3.13 on, from the time the bullet struck the president's head for the succeeding half second, from forward in this direction to backward sharply and to the left. And with such force that shortly thereafter, in fact, you can see what is, the president's head has gone down. But that first half second, I mean, to take a photograph, one eighteenth of a second out of context is the same as taking printed words out of context. A half a second from the time the bullet hit the president's head until the half a second elapsed is a rather good indication of the origin of the shots. Did you read any of this material in the Warren Commission report? Is there a discussion of what frames 312 to 321 show? No, the matter is not discussed at all. That's raised by the critics, and now we have an inventive answer. I regret to say that time is going on, and this will be the last question that we'll be, be able to handle. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Lane, I believe the last time you were here, you mentioned something about that the uh, National Archives will not release the records because of some reports on sexual activities of no, that's Mr. Liebler's statement. Oh, that was Mr. Liebler. Oh, yeah. You want to address well, this the, question, Well, Mr. the Liebler? question is, will still be addressed oh. to you. Because, in fact, um, whether that is a fact or not, uh, I would like to know. And second, that if those were to be removed and then the rest of the reports would, would be released, well, then the... Re the whole archive report would then in fact be edited and not complete and then the most important question of all is that even if they were released in the state of mind that the citizens of the country are in today uh, the, with the uh, incredible gap in the, incredi uh, the credibility gap that nobody would believe that the reports hadn't been altered or edited anyway. No, I think that raises a problem. There does come a time when the government issues so many full statements in one particular area that you have to reserve some questions and accept new evidence with a certain amount of caution. Uh, for example, Mr. Liebler has said that I have already said the photographs and x-rays uh, will be doctored before they're released. I've never said that. I say what I say now. You have to accept it with great caution. I should not be surprised if they will be. Uh, if they, I will be surprised, first of all, if they're released in the near future. I don't know why we can't see them now, why independent pathologists can't see them and why the Commission, according to Mr. Spector, made no effort ever to see them, notwithstanding Mr. Lieber's contention to the contrary. Uh, but I would not be surprised if, when new evidence is uh, released, if, if something might have happened to it during the three-year period of time that was held. But as to why the material has been suppressed, Mr. Lieber, you're quite right, it was Mr. Lieber who said it, not me. And in explaining this, when we discussed this in the lounge last time, Mr. Lieber said it has to do with sexual matters uh, and other matters of taste. That's why material has been suppressed. If a third of the documents have been suppressed by the Commission, and they all deal with the sexual abnormalities, I wonder what it is the Commission was investigating. But of course that's not the reason. The reason was given by the acting director of the National Archives, who said that the material would be suppressed for 75 years because it may be harmful to those who are alive at the present time, whatever that means. I don't know. But I do think that at the very least the time has come now for a demand by the American people to make all of the evidence available. You must remember this. Had Oswald been tried in a courtroom, he would have had a number of rights. The right to counsel, which he did not have, the right to confront the evidence, all of the evidence, which is all of the uh, rights which are ordinary in an ordinary case or any kind of a case. One of those basic rights which Oswald would have enjoyed and which the American people would have enjoyed had he not been executed in the basement of the Dallas police station by a friend of the Dallas police force. Had that not happened, Oswald would have been tried in public and every single bit of testimony would have been taken in public and the American people would have known what the evidence was against Lee Harvey Oswald. Why now after Oswald's death when he's not around so his rights cannot be protected? Why are our not rights not respected? Why are we not now entitled to see what is the evidence in the National Archives and what does it show? And I say that's the beginning of our demand. Open the archives and let the American people know what happened that day. The archives um, consist of two basic uh, types. One is the investigative reports that were developed by the FBI, Secret Service, and CIA. And the other is the actual material that was developed by the Commission, the testimony, the internal memoranda, the correspondence files. Uh, Two-thirds of the material that was developed by the investigative agencies has already been released. 
And there's a set of guidelines that were, has been published and is available in the archives, and I have a set in my office, and I'll be glad to make them available generally given the Bruin, indicating what type of material is withheld. And it's a very difficult position for me to be in here now because I'm sort of forced into the position of defending the so-called establishment, which is I'm not in the least bit psychologically interested in doing or intellectually interested in doing because I'm not that kind of a person. I don't care about that. But the fact is, and as much as we may not like many things that the FBI does and the CIA, the fact of the matter is that there is material that, 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 are, that is in those files that was developed from confidential sources that just would be, har would be harmful to the security interests of the United States who were released. Now, all right. Now, that's a fact. I, and I, don't, I, don't, I know it's psychologically unacceptable. It's unacceptable to me, too. But I just stated to you, and you can accept it or reject it. Now, Mr. Lane makes the point if we'd had a trial of Mr. Oswald, we'd now know the evidence against him. All of the evidence against Mr. Oswald or in favor of Mr. Oswald is set forth ad nauseum, I might say, in the 26 volumes of material that's right here on this cart. And there's nothing that's been withheld with respect to the evidence or for or against Mr. Oswald. The kind of material that's been withheld has been indicated in the guidelines, and I said before, primarily relates to confidential information that was developed, for example, you know, I mean, we get stuff out of the Russian embassies every once in a while. You want, you want, uh, Mr. want to make public how we get it? If you do, you can take that position. Now, the archives are reviewing this material every five years. Try, and, and they've been instructed by the, by the executive branch to release as much as is consistent with the national security every five years during these reviews. Two-thirds of the, of the agency material has been released, and the commission materials are now being reviewed by the archives, and it is being released as it's reviewed. There's material in the archives right now that Mr. Lane probably hasn't seen. I advise him to go and look at it. But I'm, may I make one more short point? An example of the kind of, of, kind of this is a whole, the whole point of all this goes to the fact that maybe the commission didn't even know what was going on through all these things. And Mr. Lane made this point forcefully in connection with Commission Exhibit 917, which is a telegram from the State Department on the Moscow Embassy to the State Department. It's got this blanked out area where it says, it says, request for Soviet citizenship by Lee Harvey Oswald, former Marine, and blank. And he has this funny line when he says, what does it say? Former star of state screen radio. And everybody laughs. It's very funny. Now, the fact of the matter is that the first part of this telegram says, Attention invited to American Embassy Moscow dispatches 234, dated 2 November, and 224, dated 2 October, concerning the renunciation of U.S. citizenship and request for Soviet citizenship by Lee Harvey Oswald, former Marine, and you go back and you look at the, at the two dispatch numbers, and you look at the two dispatches, which are referred to immediately preceding here, and you find that one of them relates to Oswald's uh, attempt to renunciate, renunciate, renounce his citizenship, and the other relates to an attempt on the part of one John Webster to renounce his citizenship. And that's what was blanked out. And I know that that was blanked out because this telegram was seen in its entirety by the commission staff before it was blanked out. And it was blanked out to preserve Mr. Webster's, to, to, to avoid associating Webster with Oswald, wrongly, I think, because the commission leaves itself open for this kind of criticism in an attempt to keep Webster's name from being associated with Oswald. And then we get this kind of argument. It was all reviewed by the commission staff, and the commission staff agreed to any deletions that occurred in this. And none of it had anything to do with the evidence for or against Lee Harvey Oswald. That's perfectly clear. We're now staggering down the home stretch. There are going to be closing statements of four minutes duration from each of the debaters. Uh, Mr. Lane leading off. Mr. Lane. All of the evidence against Lee Harvey Oswald has been published in the 26 volumes. Well, then what has been suppressed by the commission? Is it the evidence on behalf of Oswald indicating that others were involved? We don't know. Secret matters, in addition to sexual matters, now we know that national security is involved. How about the picture of the sixth floor window at the time the shots were fired? Was there a Russian agent up there and we're not allowed to see that he was there? Is there anything secret about that material? That's the kind of material which comprises a good portion of the material which has been suppressed. Nobody is asking for the government's secrets. We're trying to find out who killed the president, why the government has suppressed a good portion of the relevant evidence in this case. In regard to Commission Exhibit 917, the last reference that Mr. Liebler made, Mr. Jenner, the senior counsel of the commission in charge of the area of Oswald, whether or not he was involved in conspiracies, etc., was on a radio program with me, the Jerry Williams Show. I have the tape recording of that. I confronted him with that. He said he did not know, and no other commission lawyer knew, of that other material when they issued the report. They didn't know what had been blanked out. They didn't know if it was in reference to another man or Oswald's background. It may be now that some material has been declassified, that some of the commission lawyers now have information they didn't have then. I merely suggest that a, a lawyer for the Warren Commission 
when confronted with such an obviously uh, incendiary question, should have explored it. That's all that I said then, that's all that I said now. I'd like to deal with, uh, in the last few moments I have, with the statement that Mr. Liebler made, or question really, what, why did the Commission desperately need this conclusion? I'll tell you why I think they needed the conclusion. I cannot give you the facts on that. I can just tell you what I think. This country was in a state of shock, a traumatic experience that seized all of us with the death of the President, which was somewhat compounded two days later by the execution of the alleged assassin in the Dallas police station. The shock and the trauma was further heightened and deepened. And it was said at the outset by the local authorities and by the FBI and by your Secret Service that in the midst of the greatest security precautions taken to protect an American president in the history of this country, the president was shot down and they caught the one man who did it, Lee Harvey Oswald. Suppose they told you the truth. Suppose your government said to you, the fact is that in the midst of the greatest precautions ever taken, we don't know who did it. This is now I give you what I consider to be the most innocent explanation of why the commission desperately needed this conclusion. We don't know who did it. Shots came from two directions. We wish we could tell you more, but our investigation can't. Your FBI failed you. Your Secret Service failed you to say nothing of the local Keystone cops in Dallas. So we cannot give you the information. What would have been the reaction in this country? There are rumors now in this country, now, as to what really happened that day. I don't know any more than I've said in my book or in articles. I don't know who shot the president. But I do know that a large number of people in this country are concerned about the fact that it took place in Dallas, Texas, that the president was there at the invitation of Lyndon Johnson, and it was in Lyndon Johnson's state that the man was executed, assassinated. And we know this. Now, you just listen, and I mean what I say and not a word more. If you want to hiss, hiss when I finish. Hiss on Mr. Liebler's time. <laughs> it happened in Dallas. The man who succeeded John F. Kennedy appointed a commission. They issued a false report. And the President of the United States bears the primary responsibility for that report, President Johnson. And he bears the responsibility for the suppression of the material which you cannot see at the present time. And there are rumors in this country about whether or not this was done to benefit President Johnson. And I tell you this, and I say this, and I say this very clearly, and listen to this, because I mean precisely what I say and nothing more. If one lone nut did it, a madman, as Manchester says, sitting in front of television going mad, well, that can affect any of us, I'm afraid. <laughs> one nut did it then you don't need an explanation. That's the end. Shots from two directions, that's a conspiracy. Two or more persons, according to the law, involved acting together in concert, the commission of an illegal act. That's a conspiracy. All right, so if you say that, if you tell the truth, I'll be through in just one moment. If you tell the truth, the shots came from two different directions, you're saying a conspiracy took the life of President Kennedy, and you're saying that those people thought about it in advance. What did they have to know, even if they hated Lyndon Johnson's guts? What did they have to know if they were conspirators and thought about it in advance, that as a result of that assassination, Lyndon B. Johnson would become president of the United States. And you're not allowed to hear that. So one lone nut did it, and there is no motivation. I don't imply for a second that Lyndon Johnson was involved, but I say the problems, I say the problems, there are rumors now on surveys taken by television stations, 21% of the people say they think Lyndon Johnson was involved, even now. What would they have said if the government said, we don't know who did it, it happened in Dallas, shots from two different directions, we don't know why. You had to be given a panacea. You had to be given something which you could swallow. And the media of this country cooperated and sold it to you, and there was no criticism. And so we bought it. The American people bought it. But now the facts are out, and we don't buy it anymore. And now we say to Lyndon Johnson, or at least I say to Lyndon Johnson, let the American people know what happened that day in Dallas. That's the way to halt the rumors. A false report cannot halt the rumors because the fact that it is false will be known by us in due course as it is known by us now. Mr. Johnson, let us know who killed your predecessor. We loved him and we want to know why he died and how he died and who did it. And Mr. Johnson, if you do not give us that information, we will remember that in 1968 when it's our chance to speak.
right, Mr. Liebler, four minutes for your closing statement. Yes, there are rumors in this country. But I suggest that the existence and the presence of rumors is not so much as the result of a false and fraudulent report that was issued by the Warren Commission and by the lawyers who worked for it, but because of the activities of people like Mr. Lane, who have been going around since that time, making speeches and appearing on television and, and uh, writing books that have raised questions which have no rational basis in fact. Now, now I, I, I and all the other lawyers that work for the Commission are more than happy to have the work that we did examined publicly and critically, but honestly. We issued the 26, 26 volumes of evidence that underlie the report, and we fully expected that the American people would examine them and that they would evaluate the work that we did. The work that we did, being humans, was not perfect. But to suggest, as Mr. Lane has suggested, that it is false and fraudulent is an entirely different matter. You take lawyers, and I, I, I don't ask you to believe that, I'm, uh, that, I'm, that I always act honestly in good faith. That's not a matter that I'm going to, to put at issue here. That, that speaks for itself, and it doesn't call for any comment from me. But there's one thing I think that ought to be considered. The people who worked for the, on the staff of that commission were brought in from all over the country. I was recommended by the University of Chicago Law School. Several of the men were recommended by the Harvard Law School, the Yale Law School. There were young guys, five, six, seven years out of law school, who had never worked for the government before. We came in there, and we were very conscious of the historical nature of the event that we were associated with. And we took our responsibilities seriously. But there's one, and, and, and I, I put this to you very bluntly, if it would have been possible for any one of us to have found any evidence of a conspiracy to assassinate the president involving anyone, whether it, whether it be the, uh, the kind of a conspiracy that Mr. Lane suggests, or any other kind of conspiracy, and particularly if it had been the kind of conspiracy that Mr. Lane suggests, is it possible for one moment that I, for example, myself, having uncovered evidence of this sort, would have stood there and kept my mouth shut if I, if, if I had been told by the commission, or even, had even been suggested to me by the commission that I should do this, I would have, I myself personally, and I appeal to, the, to your selfish interest, I myself personally could have walked out in front of the Veterans of Foreign Wars building in Washington, where we had our office, and held a press conference and announced it, and I would have gone down in history as the man who uncovered the conspiracy to assassinate John F. Kennedy. We were all aware of that, and that's exactly the way we approached the problem at hand. I think that the conclusions of the Warren Report have to be judged on the evidence that's been set forth and it's available, and, and that is all of the relevant ev evidence that there is, except for the autopsy photographs and x-rays, which should be released, and it should be judged soberly and rationally and coldly, and not in the context of suggestions that the person who benefited from this was somehow responsible for it. I think that kind of suggestion speaks for itself. I haven't used up my four minutes, and there was one other thing that I wanted to say. Have I? Okay. Can I say one more thing? I, I want it. No. I, I, think, I think that the debate today perhaps has been profitable because we now get both sides before us. And I suggest that this kind of thing ought to happen again. And I suggest that, that Mr. Lane make it a point to meet the commission lawyers, to meet myself on television, and let the American people see how this thing really, how it really looks when we confront each other. Modesty prohibits me from praising Mr. Liebler for that suggestion, since it was one that I've made now for some two years. The fact is that we were invited to debate in Denver, Colorado, ABC television, and I agreed it was going to be a, a telethon. A telethon. Start at 10 o'clock in the evening and go on all night long. The next thing that had to happen was at 7 o'clock they had to have news. But we had nine hours if we wanted it. 
And I agree, pay my own way, pay my own expenses, no fee. It fell through because they tell me at ABC Television in Denver, both Jack Wilson and Barbara Story, the two hostesses, and the program director, Mr. Harmon, that Mr. Liebler insisted not only that his expenses be paid, but upon a very handsome fee, which ABC could not get out of its budget. So that debate fell through, unfortunately. Now, in addition to this, talk about uh, realizing benefit from this. I don't like it said that I realized any benefit from this. I'm, I didn't benefit from the death of my president. I assure you, and I spent two years in almost total poverty when I was writing that book with no income whatsoever. And I have invited, and I, ha I beg your pardon? <laughs> You're damn right it was worth it because now we have a debate. Now the American people are beginning to question something about that Warren report. It was worth it, yes. <laughs> Let me just, one last sentence, one last sentence. I have invited every single member of the Warren Commission to debate with me at any time or any place of his choosing, every member of the commission. And I said I would pay all the expenses for that debate, and that all the proceeds, in addition to the fee which may go to the commission member or members, and I will accept none, all the rest of the proceeds can go to the Kennedy Memorial Library, and it can be televised, and it can be recorded, they can make a film of it, anything they want. At this point, and this challenge has been outstanding for more than a year, not one member of the Warren Commission is willing to do this. When the Today program interviewed me for one hour, not one member of the Warren Commission was willing to come forward, not one. and that is now for more than a year the absolute refusal of a single member of the commission to stand up in public and defend his report. That, that this de debate was able to come off and that we are privileged to hear both sides of a very crucial issue is important because it is varied interpretations presented on issues that make a great university. To Mark Lane, to Wesley J. Liebler, and to our fine moderator, Dr. Bernstein, my sincere thanks.